From the opinion pages of the Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. New York Governor Kathy Hochul signs gun legislation after the Supreme Court struck down its concealed carry laws as the marshal of the court asks state officials to stop protests at the justices' private homes. Welcome, I'm Kyle Peterson with the Wall Street Journal. We're joined today by my colleagues, editorial board member Alicia Finley and editorial writer Mane ukwe Barua. Welcome to you both. Last month, the Supreme Court ruled 6-3 in New York State Rifle and Pistol Association v. Bruin that the state of New York's concealed carry laws were unconstitutional because the Second Amendment protects a general right to carry a gun in public for self-defense. And now the state of New York has received responded to this with new legislation signed by Governor Kathy Hochul. Let's listen to her at a press conference last week. The Supreme Court of the United States of America tells us that we now have to uh, repeal, repealed a law that's been on the books for over 100 years, back when probably Teddy Roosevelt was president of the United States. That's how long the law was there. And now they're trying to, they're totally out of touch with what we want for our state. And we want safer streets, not more guns on our streets. Governor Hochul also responded to some questions from reporters, and I thought this was a particularly interesting exchange. Listen to this. Do you have the numbers to show that it's the concealed carry permit holders that are committing crimes? Because the lawful gun owner will say that you're attacking the wrong person. It's really people that are getting these guns illegally that are causing the violence, not the people going and getting the permit legally, and that's the basis for the whole Supreme Court argument. Do you have the numbers? I don't need to have numbers. I don't need, I don't have to have a data point to point to to say that this is going to matter. All I know is I have a responsibility to the people of this state to have sensible gun safety laws. And this one was not devised by the Hochul administration. It comes out of an administration from 1908. I don't need a data point to make the case that I have a responsibility to protect the people of this state. So, Alicia, just to start off with, I guess, what do you make of that exchange where the governor is asked, what do you say to gun owners who are lawful and are carrying their guns in public for self-defense? Do you have the data that this is going to make any difference? And the governor says, I don't need any data. Well, I think it's, first of all, ironic because there have been a lot of shootings in New York in the last couple of years in which the offender or the the shooter was found to have committed other crimes with guns. And, and while they weren't, they were never charged. Charged for it. I mean, they were on never charged for the other assault crimes as well. There seems to be some kind of contradiction here in which the state wants to essentially prosecute people who want to carry guns for self-defense, but then is not willing to prosecute. And this goes back to also the district attorney's office in, in New York City, the Manhattan DA, as well as the others, do not want to prosecute actual gun crimes, the people who are found to be committing crimes and carrying weapons that aren't licensed. And so it can be interesting to get the data on that, but the state seems to be unwilling to even collect it, maybe because they know it would show that, you know, most people who have the, currently have concealed carry weapons under the good cause rule, which was at issue in the case, aren't going around shooting people. It's the people who don't have the licenses and, you know, in, in many cases have got guns illegally, bought them on the black market or stolen them. They're the ones who are committing the crimes. And the New York law also seems to be testing what it can get away with under this new Supreme Court precedent. So one thing I would point to is the majority opinion joined by six justices written by Clarence Thomas in the Bruin case says that it does not question regulations that prohibit firearms in sensitive places. But it says that a state can't just define everything as a sensitive place. Justice Clarence Thomas has a reference where he says a state couldn't just say Manhattan is a sensitive area. And the the New York law doesn't go quite that far, Monet, but it goes pretty far. I mean, it says sensitive places include airports, public transportation, playgrounds, parks, zoos, schools, entertainment buildings, houses of worship, libraries, bars and restaurants that serve alcohol, Times Square. And it suggests that under this law, New York's response to the Supreme Court's ruling is that you can carry a public firearm and maybe you can go in the streets. But if you 
wander into Central Park, then you're probably guilty of a crime. Yeah, I frankly think that you're being overly charitable in suggesting that the New York legislature is testing the ruling. I think it would be more accurate to say that they're flouting it. I mean, generally, when you have someone testing a judicial opinion, basically they're they're looking at the ambiguity that's left in the ruling and trying to, you know, sensibly see how far they might be able to push something that would fit within those boundaries. Whereas in this case, they basically have said, as you described, that every single type of public place can be defined as a sensitive place if they so choose. It includes bars, restaurants, but also places like the subway and public parks, which are probably the places where New Yorkers, at least New York City dwellers, would be most interested in potentially concealing weapons. But we have seen, obviously, an increase in crime over the past couple of years, and there are a lot of people who are afraid to go into some of these public areas, and they want to be able to go through a reasonable legal process and acquire a handgun and wear it on their hip. And so New York is basically going far beyond what anyone would, I think, reasonably think would be permitted by the Supreme Court's ruling. And I think it's really only a matter of time before their law is challenged. It's possible that they might get a favorable judge sort of at the district level or maybe even the Second Circuit Court of Appeals. But it's completely impossible to think that the Supreme Court that just struck down their previous law limiting public carrying of weapons would potentially uphold this new law, which restricts that right so heavily. Alicia, do you agree with that assessment? And do you think that it will take long for the Supreme Court to try to enforce what it seems to have just said in this Bruin case? I mean, we all remember that after the Supreme Court recognized that the Second Amendment was an individual right, that case was called Heller, and it's in 2008, then it took more than a decade for us to get to this next Second Amendment case that was issued last month. So, I mean, mean, do you think the court's new 6-3 conservative majority will be more interested and willing to get into some of these cases and expressly delineate, in its view, what the Second Amendment requires? Well, if you recall, a a few years after Heller, the court took the McDonald case in which it applied basically the Heller decision to the states. So I think there would be an interest in the Supreme Court in basically underlining, perhaps honing its opinion just to say exactly what could be treated or what is legal and what isn't legal under its opinion. Because there was a lot of ambiguity. New York definitely tried to exploit that ambiguity with its new law, which, you know, instead of using a good cause, requiring a good showing of good cause for a gun permit, concealed carry permit, it now requires a showing of good moral character, which obviously is in the eye of the bureaucrat that is issuing the permit. They would interview the person and could even look at the social media accounts, interview people, references, you know, it would be kind of like a co-op board application in New York. There really isn't much transparency and they could reject you for any reasons and you don't really know why at the end of the day. Um, I mean, there are, in terms of the sensitive places, you know, I think it's completely reasonable to, you know, restrict it. Like maybe schools, you know, that's actually schools are defined under federal law as sensitive places in terms of immigration enforcement, you know, courts, you know, could be sensitive places. But I think it's the expansive nature of it, to uh, Manet's point about, you know, it applying to you know, bars, restaurants, all of Times Square shows that it's not narrowly tailored, which it would be considered under the Second Amendment any kind of balancing test. There is, and nor does it seem like the government could show a compelling purpose in in doing in restricting these rights in these places. So I do think that this could be um, another ripe case going up to the Supreme Court, but it could also s- still need to percolate in the appellate courts. You're probably going to see other states try to test or flout, as Manet said, Supreme Court ruling. And so you may see a couple of cases uh, or even you know, split circuit opinions on these issues go up to the Supreme Court in a few years. And that's true, I think, for another issue that this raises is the law defines private property as a default of no carrying as gun free unless the owners have signage up saying otherwise. And that's kind of an interesting legal issue because I don't think anybody disputes here that the owner of a store or a Walmart or a gas station can define whether people, customers are allowed to carry on its property, but setting the state law 
the default is no carry unless there is signage saying otherwise. I don't know which way that would come out. That certainly is an interesting legal issue and also suggests that this may only allow carrying in places where there's broad social consensus. I don't know, maybe small towns, upstate, there will be places where most shops will allow guns, but it does allow for some variability. Then on the point that Alicia makes about this good character, so recall that the original New York law required someone to show that they had good cause in order to need a concealed carry permit, and good cause was defined as some specific threat to you, not a generalized threat. So if you said, my job involves carrying cash through high crime neighborhoods, that wasn't good enough. You had to have a specific threat to you, and that's gone as a result of the Supreme Court's ruling. But the law still requires to make a showing of good moral character. The new law defines that as meaning the essential character, temperament, and judgment necessary to be entrusted with a weapon and to use it only in a manner that does not endanger oneself or others. And I mean, I think that's it's a general matter. I think people agree with that. You want people who are carrying weapons to have good character and temperament and judgment. Though, as Alicia mentions, it, the law does allow local officials to check social media feeds, for example, as a way of determining good character. And in some cases, maybe things will surface in social media, Manet, that could be red flagged under New York's red flag law and really does show a propensity or suggestions of violence. On the other hand, I do wonder what else local officials might see on those social sites and flag these things, political posts, bad jokes, and flag people as having not good moral character. And I I could envision some cases going up the legal chain on that matter too. Right. I think you highlighted all of the important concerns regarding the good moral character requirement. Frankly, I do think that it probably is permissible, as you said, that there are plenty of other uh, state and local laws that require people to be background checked, uh, which involves a kind of investigation into statements that they might have made in order to obtain and carry a weapon. The problem with the New York law is that it just seems much too vague. They don't really seem to lay out exactly what they mean by good moral character. I think what generally has been upheld as a proper definition of that term would be that the person is sane, that they have sort of their basic wits about them, and that they haven't made direct threats of any kind. And so if New York is able to further substantiate their moral character requirement in a way that suggests that we're really just probing people's social media accounts and asking for witnesses to confirm that they are in good mental health and that they haven't sort of made any threat of violence, then I think that that makes sense. But so time will have to tell exactly what the execution of that provision is going to be. And then to your earlier point about setting a default for private establishments as prohibiting carrying guns unless they have explicitly said that guns are allowed. I also don't really know what the legal merits of that are. It's possible that it could be challenged. But frankly, I do think that there is a case for regional variability, which is kind of what you're implying. In sparser places like upstate New York, it's much likelier to me that you'll have a lot of establishments that are perfectly comfortable with the idea that most of their patrons are carrying guns. And so it it wouldn't make sense to require them to disclose that guns are allowed. Whereas in a place like New York City, I would think that most individual proprietors would not want people to be carrying guns in their establishment. And if that is kind of an overwhelming consensus among bars and restaurants in New York, I could see it making good sense to say, if you are going to be a restaurant that does allow guns, you should explicitly make that clear through signage. I'm not sure whether the law is able to require that, but it does make sense just kind of as an ethical practice. Hang tight. We'll be right back. You're listening to Potomac Watch from The Wall Street Journal. From the opinion pages of The Wall Street Journal, this is Potomac Watch. Welcome back. Uh, I take Monet's point before the break about regional variability, but I guess that's why it seems to me that this kind of default standard might be better set at the local level than at the state level. So in upstate small towns, you could have a default of carrying is allowed on private property unless signage is otherwise. And in cities like New York City, you could reverse that and have a default that it's not allowed unless there's signage otherwise. Alicia, to the point about this good character standard, I mean, there may be 
cases where somebody is denied for reasons that they don't think are fair and will sue, and courts may say that they're correct, that they can't be denied based on whatever it is the local official was flagging. But there could also be a case you could imagine that the whole standard is too vague to operate and provides local officials too much leeway to deny people for whatever reason they want, which was, again, part of what was at issue in the case the Supreme Court decided last month. So do you have any sense of whether you think, I mean, maybe it will it will turn on the facts and how this law actually operates, but do you think there's a real possibility of it being challenged on vagueness grounds and the whole thing being thrown out again? I would agree with that. The Supreme Court has shown a lot of skepticism toward vague laws. I mean, Neil Gorsuch in particular, especially when it comes to either the First Amendment or other, you know, individual liberties, as well as, you know, criminality, um, trying to enforce vague criminal laws and here uh, against people. Here, because of the, I think the the law does obviously specify the sensitive locations, but to your point on good moral character, it's extremely vague and it's not clear how the regulators or bureaucrats would interpret it. Also note that the Supreme Court recently has been very tough on you know federal laws and federal regulations that are too vague, too ambiguous. I mean, it doesn't clearly delineate what is expected or required under the law and when that give regulators or bureaucrats way too much discretion. And so I, I could see the court being similarly skeptical of a state law that does the same and that doesn't clearly uh, explain how people who are seeking these permits are going to be judged under the standard. Of course, you know, the, the people who it will depend in part on who is challenging the permit and are they going to challenge it preemptively, seek an injunction against the law, or are they going to do it once they are rejected and, and will there be some kind of discovery process, which could be interesting, or why they were rejected. Finally, the marshal of the Supreme Court, Gail Curley, has written state and local officials in Virginia and Maryland asking them to enforce laws against protesting at private homes and specifically the homes of these Supreme Court justices. And I'll read a section from one of these letters. It says, Protest activity at justices' homes as well as threatening activity has increased since May. For weeks on end, large groups of protesters chanting slogans, using bullhorns and banging drums have picketed justices' homes. And it goes on to say this is exactly the kind of conduct that the Maryland and Montgomery County laws prohibit. This is reading, obviously, from the Maryland letter. And Manet, it's an interesting game of hot potato being played here where there are state laws against this. There is in Montgomery County, Maryland, there's a local ordinance against this. There's a federal law against intimidating or trying to influence judges. And nobody seems to want to enforce those laws. That's right. It's been really surprising and disappointing to see government officials at every level acknowledging that there's a problem uh, with these different groups picketing these homes and with threats being made against the justices, but none of them wanting to enforce any of the several provisions that would allow some of these protests to be curtailed. It was interesting to see that uh, Governor Hogan of Maryland and Governor Youngkin of Virginia sent this letter to the Justice Department asking Merrick Garland to enforce the federal statute, and I don't believe that the Justice Department has made clear exactly why it is unwilling or unable to enforce that statute. But as you implied, there are similar provisions in both Virginia and Maryland that would allow those governors to take action. We did see the Maryland governor's office come out and say that it has some constitutional questions about whether it's allowed to curtail the protests, because obviously the First Amendment does broadly protect the right to protest publicly. But frankly, if Larry Hogan believes that there's a constitutional problem with enforcing Maryland's statute, I don't see why the same problem wouldn't apply to the federal statute. And perhaps you could clear that question up for me if there's something I'm missing. But it seems as if the courts generally have upheld certain carve outs to restrict protests when they do enter the realm of public threat, particularly threats against sort of federal officials that might be trying to influence them. And so it seems like any of these three jurisdictions, both the federal level and the Maryland and Virginia governments, do have the authority to enforce these laws, but they just are afraid of the political blowback that might come if they're is an encounter between police officers and protesters, and so they're all trying to see if they can push it off on somebody else. I have not looked at the Maryland statute in detail. I have looked at the Virginia one, however, and that 
prohibits picketing before or about the residence or dwelling place of any individual. And it has an exception, though, for picketing during a labor dispute of the place of employment involved in such labor dispute, the picketing in any lawful manner of a construction site. And so the argument there, I think, is that since there's a labor exception to it, it would not be considered a neutral content, neutral restriction, and therefore would be unconstitutional under the First Amendment. But the federal law, to my eye, is more interesting because that one specifically bans picketing courthouses or residents of judges with intent to influence the judge. Or, I mean, it also applies to jurors, witnesses, and so forth. It's a little more broad than than I just said. But Alicia, to me, especially in this period where we had the leak of the Dobbs decision, the abortion decision in May, and then it was just released recently, especially in that period, it certainly looks like those people outside the houses of the Supreme Court justices were trying to influence the outcome of that case. And so it does seem to me that the federal statute at least would apply. Well, I think it kind of also turns on the manner of speech if it's construed as threatening versus just lobbying, essentially lobbying government for address of your grievances. So if the protesters were to actually make some kind of physical threats or even say something to the extent that Shelton Whitehouse did, you know, a few years ago about the Supreme Court would reap the whirlwind, um, that could be construed as, you know, threatening the court, threatening the judiciary, whereas merely conveying or, or protesting a Supreme Court ruling, I actually think that that's harder, tougher constitutional question because the First Amendment clearly does protect the, the right to you know peacefully assemble. Again, the, that that's another issue is whether these protests are construed as peaceful, you know, to the extent that they're, you know, using bullhorns and, and disturbing the peace, you know, they may not be. But I do think there are significant constitutional concerns to both the Maryland, I mean, as you mentioned, the Virginia law and the federal law. And it's not clear, as Manet said, if what these officials are just passing the buck because they don't want to force law or that they actually do have serious constitutional concerns and don't want to be challenged. Well, with regard to threats, so when Governors Yunkin and Hogan sent that letter to the Attorney General asking him to enforce the federal law, they cited one comment from a protester that was, quote, if you take away our choices, we will riot, unquote. And Manet, I take the constitutional concerns seriously, but it does seem to me that we're establishing a precedent here that if you don't like what a federal official is doing, You can gather 100 or 200 or however many people you can get and you can stand outside their house at all hours of the night and and scream at them. And maybe you have to abide some sort of restriction like you have to keep walking back and forth so you can say that you're not actually stopping in front of their house. You're parading through the streets. It does seem to me that this is escalation in our politics and one that we may come to regret. And Manet will give you the last word. Right. I think that enforcing public safety always risks running into the problem of crowds assemble with different purposes. And we saw this in the summer of 2020 during the racial protests. Yes, there were some peaceful protesters, but then there were also some bona fide rioters who were burning down buildings and police wanted to respect the rights of the peaceful protesters while also enforcing the law against the harmful ones. We're in the exact same spot here with regard to the Supreme Court. I understand that there is a provision for kind of legal picketing and uh, lobbying the government, but it's clear that a lot of these protests have crossed the threshold into direct threats. And so one of these executives is going to need to step up and be willing to actually protect the safety of the justices. Thank you, Manet. Thank you, Alicia. Thank you all for listening. You can email us at pwpodcast at wsj.com. If you like the show, please hit that subscribe button on your favorite podcast app. We'll be back tomorrow with another edition of Potomac Watch.